Thank you, Maria. And thank you everybody for being here. It's so exciting um, to be with you and to be talking about this topic and focusing on um, something that is near and dear to my heart. And I'm just thrilled um, to be able to have this conversation and introduce you to Julia Skinner. Julia is a, she's the author of Our Fermented Lives, and I'm sure everyone has um, realized that so we're, because we're highlighting this is definitely a book launch for her. Her book was released in September, so it's newly released, and it's a beautiful book. I've been reading it um, for the past week and a half, trying to get familiar with it and, and look at the recipes and, and just the information. So I think we're in for a really juicy evening talking to her about her book. First, I am going to actually read you her um, bio so I don't miss anything and so you can get familiar with her. So Julia, Julia is the founder of Root Kitchens, and she is the author of Our Fermented Lives. She is also the author of A History of How... Oh, that's the sub that's the subtitle. Sorry, let me read that again because subtitles are very important to books, right, Julia? Yeah. <laughs> they often tell more of the story than the actual title. So let me read this properly. The book is called Our Fermented Lives: A History of How Fermented Foods Have Shaped Cultures and Communities. Through Root, uh, Julia offers classes on fermentation, on food waste reduction, and traditional cooking techniques, as well as consulting. She offers private lessons, and she offers a membership with recipes, a newsletter, and more. And we'll be putting her um, contact information in the chat as we go along, so you can um, check out some of those things that she offers. As a writer, she covers fermentation history and is always curious about the stories behind our food. She has also written and illustrated and uh, written and illustrated The Hidden Cosmos, a fermentation oracle and recipe deck, which I really um, adore. I have a copy of that myself. And she also has written Afternoon Tea, a history as well as numerous other books and articles. And like I said, we will be putting her contact information into the um, chat. So I was really um, interested in talking to Julia um, for a couple reasons, specifically her um, her curiosity be, curiosity about a history of fermentation in communities. This is just such an intriguing thing. And of course, the microbes are part of that community. We're part of that community, all of those things. So um, if you don't win the book tonight and you don't have it, make sure you go and get it. Here it is. It's a beautiful book and um, I really highly recommend it. And then her, um, the Hidden co Cosmos, the Fermentation Oracle deck is right here. And so I highly recommend that you get that too. I thought it was curious that there was a Fermentation Oracle deck. And at first I was like, oh, that's so odd. I wonder how that works. And then I pulled a card and I was really in intrigued and, and excited about it. So welcome, Julia. I was hoping that maybe, um, I don't know if you have your Oracle deck there. If you don't, I can pull a card, but I was hoping we could pull a card together yeah. this start the evening. Yeah, maybe if you want to pull one, mine is actually in the other room. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you if you want to pull a card for us. Yes, just kind of see what the uh, yeah. what's in store for us this <laughs> evening. <laughs> Because even though we talk a little bit about this, everyone, we, we don't know entirely what's in store. <laughs> we'll let the conversation lead us. So I've got the deck here. I'm shuffling it. And I'm going to go ahead and everyone put your intention out there. And we'll see what we what we come up with here. For the... Okay. So then I have to go to the book and look it up. So what a fun thing to really look at. Um, using fermentation as an oracle. I just really um, love it. Let me see what we've got here. Oh, there we go. Okay. So here's what we got. We got Mead of Inspiration and Poetry. Lovely. So this is the card. Do you ever wonder where inspiration and poetry come from? According to Norse mythology, they come from a very special mead, brewed by the gods and shared with humans. Mead is sweet, but not always. 
and intoxicating, it reminds us, sorry, I lost my place for a second there. It reminds us of those things that bring us sweetness and joy. So the inquiry here is what adds so much goodness to your life that you feel almost drunk with happiness? Feel gratitude for these things and focus your attention on nurturing them. You might find some new inspiration as a result. That is just lovely, Julia. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that seems that seems like a good a good fortune for this evening. <laughs> I think so. So joy and sweetness. And yeah. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your journey to writing the book and um, what inspired you to write about fermentation and and learn about the history of fermentation. Yeah, so I've been fermenting food for probably about 20 years. Um, and when I started, I learned from friends, you know, as many of us did, we learned from people in our lives. Um, and then I started getting books and I started learning more, kind of diving more into it. The more and more I got into it, the more that I became curious about the history. I've been a food historian for a while. Um, I've studied history in other ways as well. Um, my dissertation was a the history of a specific library. So I do history kind of as a big part of my life. And as as I was researching um, and kind of figuring out what I might write a book about, it occurred to me that there wasn't a history of fermentation. And so I had been kind of wondering for a while, like, oh, it'd be nice to write a book, but like, I don't know. I've written a couple. I don't know what the next one would be on. And then kind of just had this moment of like, oh, fermentation history. The history is kind of interspersed in places, but nobody's really just written the history as the primary topic. So that was kind of how we got here. Nice. And I love that, you know, with your subtitle, How Fermented Foods Have Shaped Cultures and Communities, I really am intrigued by that. And I'm wondering, could you just share with us a couple things about that that you discovered in your research that maybe surprised you or or brought you joy <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean I you know there's there's so many ways fermentation has shaped our lives you know something that Sandra talks about in the foreword is that you know we've co-evolved with these microbes and so this is we've had our relationship with these microbes is both us evolving from bacteria and kind of like that we have become such a drastically different thing from bacteria is such speaks to possibility and speaks to that anything really is possible. And I think that's very interesting um, that we still have a close relationship with them biologically, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis our microbiome. Um, that I found that to be very interesting. And then when we look at the ways that we eat food, um, you know, for example, all the ways that we've used beer, that we've used beer to uh, help make water safe. We've used beer um, to provide us B vitamins and, you know, also to get drunk off of. <laughs> so, yeah. <Enjoy>. yeah. <laughs> lots, lots of purposes. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, and actually, you know, being an organization that's herbally focused, uh, we, um, you know, I'm aware of the history of beer and different herbs being utilized to preserve the herbs as well mm -hmm. i know you're probably familiar with stephen buner's beautiful book sacred herbal healing beers which i really enjoy uh, the as that aspect of that book yeah yeah and i found it interesting that book was actually um where i learned that fermenting in brews fermenting different herbs and brews will sometimes uh alter their medicinal properties uh somewhat and so that i found that very interesting too um i'm sure you know way more about that aspect of it than i do but well yeah because Yero was a specific one that he mentioned right and that those some other herbs were used for that bittering agent mm -hmm. not just hops and we landed on hops um and I, actually that i'm not positive why we chose hops do you have any um information about that so yeah so we prior to hops um european beers used what was called gruit which depending where you were was different blends of bittering herbs um and so yeah we would use these bittering herbs and then at some point i think was it charlemagne 
that was really into hops um, and advocated for them. And then, but many people didn't use hops still. Um, and then eventually I think we settled on them in part because they had a stronger preservative effect than some of the other herbs that we were using. And so when we think about things like an India pale ale, the reason why it was an India pale ale is because there was a bunch of hops thrown in it to help it last for longer on longer sea voyages. So kind of an interesting story there. Um, but yeah, King Henry VIII, for example, hated hops. He didn't want us to use hops in our beer. He wanted, you know, good old English ale to have other stuff in it. So interesting story yeah so one of the things that's interested me um when you talk about um preserving things to travel across the seas i know sauerkraut was a big part of that um and i wonder if you could might be able to talk a little bit about that yeah so sauerkraut you know sauerkraut story is interesting because i think when we think of sauerkraut today we think of you know germany various parts of eastern europe um sauerkraut itself what we think happened all the evidence we have points to it actually originating in china um in Mon mongolia and so in mongolia you know you had people coming and conquering eastern europe you had people conquering all of these spaces and bringing what um this preserved cabbage that they were making that was preserved in rice wine vinegar and so it was basically like a quick pickled cabbage as opposed to the salt fermented cabbage we know today and so they brought this down and, you know, it's an example of one of the many ways that we share foods across cultures and not all of them being, you know, super happy and positive, right? But um, the foods do still share across the cultures, even in those moments. And so they brought, um, they brought this pickled cabbage, people liked it, but then, you know, rice wine vinegar isn't something that was probably very easy to get in say you know eastern europe at that time and so they you know they worked with what they had and what they had was salt and so we had we had it evolve into what we know today well one of the things um i understand as well is that they carried cabbage across the sea as uh, because it produces vitamin c in when it's um fermenting that it helped to prevent scurvy because people didn't have access to fresh food so they didn't have vitamin c in their diet and that that was one of the purposes um or maybe it was a more of a byproduct at first <laughs> of um carrying sauerkraut across the ocean yeah, yeah, that, you know, that and just any, you know, any vegetables and roughage you could get in your diet when you're on the ocean was probably very welcome. Right, absolutely. <laughs> so I want to back up just a little bit because I know um, when we were preparing for the call tonight, I realized in some of the responses we got that we may have a real wide spectrum of folks on this call. Um, some people are already fermenting a lot of things, some people just starting out their journey. And I wondered if we maybe we could talk a little bit about the fermentation process itself and the safety of it, because that's one of the things that has always really um, heartened me is that it's really a safe way to preserve food, safer than most people would think. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered if you could just go back to basics a little bit and talk about that and maybe throw in a little bit of history and science for to stretch the people who are <laughs> not so new. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And I, you know, if you have other, other tips too, I think, I think we both, I mean, obviously have plenty to say we've both been fermenting forever, but yeah. So I really like, I always turn to um, Sanders definition of fermentation as the transformative action of microbes, because most other definitions ask us to only think about some kinds of fermentation and that encompasses it fully. And so you know, that transformation aspect is key. What we're trying to do is make cabbage into sauerkraut, make milk into yogurt, make grains into beer, make, you know, make something into something. Um, and it tends, you know, it's not an overnight process. And sometimes it is typically not, <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it tends to be somewhat slow um, and very safe too. I mean, there's, especially with vegetable, fruit and vegetable fermentation, if it's off, you will know it's off. It will smell bad. It will have like fuzzy, colorful molds on it, which you should not eat. Um, 
things like that, you know, and, you know, and I always tell people to trust their senses and trust themselves. You know, when we, when we get to things like meat fermentation, it, you know, it, it does require a little more specialized consideration, but for something like sauerkraut, I mean, really just trust your senses and, you know, if you're not sure about it, don't eat it, but it's so, it's so safe to do. And I, I mean, I've been making sauerkraut, like I said, for 20 years, I've never gotten sick off of eating it and I've eaten, I don't even know how much sauerkraut at this point, <laughs> I ate it thousands of times probably. Jeez, well. <laughs> Well, a couple of things I often mention to people um, on the topic of safety is the concept of a sensory quorum. And this is why we inoculate ferments and we inoculate them with microbes that we know are active and are effective and have certain flavors and effects is that bacteria, when they um, meet a, a similar bacteria, they grow exponentially. And that's how some of the pathogenic bacteria can be crowded out when you have the beneficial bacteria growing. And so like when we make yogurt and we inoculate the milk with our um, bacteria cultures, we know that that's what's going to grow in there is the, are the beneficial bacteria. And the other piece is having um, carbohydrates and sugars present. And that's where the meat um, fermentation gets tricky because you have to introduce something that to a substrate to ferment onto, right? <laughs> so um so just talking like I often think about that too like when I make sauerkraut if I add carrots it goes faster because the carrots are higher in carbohydrates than the cabbage itself where the cabbage you're relying more on the cellulose so yeah it's it's yeah it's it's so interesting you know you can do it from your senses and the basics and then understanding a little bit about what's happening um seems really helpful to me yeah, and there's just such a wide variety of of ferments, and at this point, so many good resources too. Which, I mean, I'm sure when you were starting out, when I was starting out, you know, there was there were fermentation books, but they're not like there are today. I mean, it wasn't like you had sections of bookstores that had you know preserving books like we do now. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, I think it makes it a lot easier to get good guidance. Well, speaking of different types of ferments, when we um, met to, in preparation for um, our conversation here, we talked about condiments, and uh, and I wondered if maybe we could have a conversation about that yeah. and mention your recipe, which I was excited about, which is mushroom ketchup. Yeah, so so we had talked about mushroom ketchup um, because Linda had asked if I had any mushroom recipes in here. I was like, oh wait, I have mushroom ketchup, um, and. So mushroom ketchup is really interesting because it's the precursor to tomato ketchup. So ketchup itself has this very interesting history. It's initially based in a Chinese fish sauce that was brought over to England um, via trade. And once it got to England, um, people were like, wow, we like this stuff. Um, for some reason, even though England, I mean, they have fish in England, right? But they didn't they they decided to make it with other things as well. They did make some fish sauces, but they were like, let's branch out and also make this with other things. And so you have in the early modern period in like the 1600s, this really wide variety of different sauces and condiments made with walnuts, mushrooms, like all these different things that they were like, let's try making a fish sauce equivalent, like this savory amino sauce sort of thing out of whatever. Um, and so the mushroom ketchup is interesting because you basically ferment it for a short period and then you cook it down with um, with vinegar and spices. And it's it tastes very much, and it is actually a precursor to uh, Worcestershire sauce. And so it's kind of a similar flavor profile. Um, and so that was that was ketchup for a long time. And then eventually because tomatoes, we we don't always think of it this way, but tomatoes, especially tomato uh, seeds and pulp, have a lot of umami. And so tomatoes were another thing that they were using. And then Heinz at one of the state fairs, uh, or sorry, the um, World's Fair, introduced a commercially made tomato ketchup. And then, you know, he was like, oh, we have this savory ketchup and now it's, you know, kind of sweet and savory. And so it's crowded out all the other ketchups. 
that's how we got to where we are. I have also in the book a fermented tomato ketchup. Um, honestly, when I make uh, make tomato ketchup, um, I don't make it that often. I just buy it, but I make um, mushroom ketchup a lot. Mm, nice. <laughs> Well, I know I make a lot of different condiments and really love to have them out on the table. And one of the things I use as a condiment is miso. And uh, I often put, you know, put that out on the table. You can use it as a spread. You can use it in sauces, add it to any soup. And I was wondering if you um, have a little bit of to say about miso and utilizing that and or making it. Yeah, so miso... Um... I've only been making miso for about four or five years, um, but I love, love making it. I was surprised at how easy it is to make. Um, I, I had this impression it was really hard. Yeah. And then I did it. And it was so much simpler <laughs> than I thought. Yeah. I was, for some reason, I thought koji fermentation, I guess because it was mold based and I hadn't done a lot with mold based stuff. I always assumed it was a lot harder than it is. And it's really, I mean, you know, making your own soy sauce, making your own amazake and your own miso and all these different things is actually not that hard. Um, yeah, and so with miso, I mean, you basically just make this bean paste with this koji and you pack it in, you push all the air out and you let it ferment. And how long you let it ferment, um, you know, can influence what its final flavor is. So the longer you let it ferment, the more deep kind of umami flavors you get in those beans. Um, and a lot of us make misos with all kinds of different stuff. I have one, Kirsten Shockey, um, who's one of my friends and another fermentation author. She made a toasted sourdough miso. And so I've started making that. And it's you use the same miso making process, but with your leftover sourdough and you like crisp it up and soak it and um use it like you would cooked beans um really really good i have a ton of that right now um oh, nice yeah and it's great you know i like i like using those kinds of misos in soups in different you know rather than making because i make a lot of white miso soup and just have that all the time but i'll use something like that sourdough miso is the basis of like a vegetable stew or something to kind of add some richness or you know i really like it in dressings um really any marinade it's really good in uh like chocolate chip cookies and baked goods uh miso is really good in there it's yeah it's so much more versatile than i think we we assume it might be and it's so interesting to me because I've found that too, like even adding these umami flavors to sweets mm -hmm. is, is really a nice combination. And it's not something I think in the Western diet, you know, it's either we either go for sweet or, you know, salty and, and we don't always think of them even together. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I really enjoy doing that as well. And I know um, when I was at the residency with Sander Katz, I had tasted some nut miso, which I really, um, I haven't played with it, but it's something that's on one, you know, in my list of agenda of things to do. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. I um, I just actually made um, a sunflower seed one. So I realized I had a lot of sunflower <laughs> seeds um i had like quarts and quarts of them and i was like okay i should do something before these all go rancid um and yeah again very very easy um you just you know you soak them and um yeah blend it up and add your koji very very simple um yeah and versatile too you know those those nut misos in particular i really really like with fresh vegetables and roasted vegetables they go really well with them they really do it's just it's such a nice combination so i wanted to go back to something you were saying you were talking about the sourdough um, miso which is intriguing to me and one of the things um I hear all the time is people are like, what do I do with all of the sourdough? And it was something that um, Sander talked a lot about when I spent time with him was like, what, you know, we made sourdough soup when I was there and I was mm -hmm. like, oh, this is so intriguing. So sourdough, um, you know, miso, this is a great idea. And I'm just wondering if you have any other tips for those bread makers who are wondering, what do we do with our sourdough? 
<laughs> well, you know, I mean, if we think, you know, if we look back into history, something that's very good is um, is Kvass. And so beat Kvass, I think, is the one that we most often know. But Kvass can also just be made with bread or beets and bread or carrots and bread or what, you know, but it's basically, so kvass is basically a sparkling um, non-alcoholic beverage. Um, so you get, you know, you, it's, it's a probiotic beverage and it can, it's like salty, savory, um, really, really good. That's a good way to use sourdough. I'm trying to think how else I've been using sourdough lately. Um, I mean, really, the miso has been the bulk of it. I just love the sourdough miso so much. Um, well, I know I make um, bread, and uh, I, but I also make crackers and, you know, pancakes and waffles and yeah. you know, all of those things and biscuits. I make a sourdough biscuit. So you can kind of stretch out sourdough muffins and, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, granted they're bread products, but still like it's easy to sometimes yeah. crackers rather than a loaf of bread. So it looks like we have a couple of people asking what is koji. Um, yeah, that's why my hand was up to bring that to your attention. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm also glad to see that Aurora brought up South River Miso who sell um, koji. So if you decide to go on a koji making journey, they don't ship in summer, um, as as she mentioned. Um, but yes, they, they have very good koji. I use theirs a lot. But so koji is um aspergillus arisei and it's a it's a mold um and it's used to ferment um i mean a, a ton of stuff but including miso soy sauce um amazake sake plenty of different things some people use it in uh, fish sauce some people use it for charcuterie um it's very very versatile and it's yeah so it's a fermentation mold so you're using a mold rather than bacteria and it's typically grown on rice. So you first um, you grow the mold on rice, and that's what you can purchase from South River Miso is the actual rice that's already been inoculated with the mold. You also can buy mold spores yourself and play around with them um, uh, inoculating. And being that we live in the Midwest where a lot of um, people harvest wild, at least foragers harvest wild rice, I've been playing around with inoculating wild rice with the koji, which is kind of fun. So um, along those lines, um, do you want to talk a little bit about foraging and adding wild edibles to your um, ferments? Yeah. Yeah, so I so I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and so we have we're very blessed that we can forage year round here, um, which is great. Um, and so right now, if I were to walk outside my door and it wasn't you know too dark to see what I was doing, um, there's violet leaves are a big thing right now. Um, you know, and just like in the Midwest, also, you know, like barks, like we have, you know, a lot of mimosa bark, there's a big mimosa tree right next to my house, um, you know, and all these other things. Um, chickweed is coming up right now. We have two seasons of chickweed. We have uh, springtime and fall chickweed. Goldenrod just finished. Um, yeah, you know, and it's great because I think, you know, wherever you are in the world, we can all incorporate these wonderful flavors into our food and fermentation allows us a way to get really creative with that and to reuse maybe parts of those things that were like oh I I gathered too much let's say chickweed I don't you know there's only so much pesto I can eat <laughs> um well you know all you have to do so um because vinegar is such a good extractive for minerals and chickweed is a such a mineral heavy food you know, you can just pack that in a jar and put some unpasteurized vinegar on it and congratulations, let it sit a month and you've got this delicious mineral rich vinegar that you can use. Um, I've also found those vinegars, this is not always true with everything, but I find every time that I make a chickweed vinegar, it always just like grows vinegar mothers like crazy for some reason. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> they're just like, they both really like to be with each other. Um, Goldenrod vinegar is also really good. I use that in cocktails and mocktails a lot. Um, it's kind of a nice piney, herbaceous sort of flavor. Um, 
Yeah. And, you know, and it's, it's so fun. Um, and it's a good way to use up uh, invasive edibles too. You know, I'm sure many people in here are probably familiar with Pascal Bowder's argument that when we, instead of dealing with invasive species by treating them as food, we just like spray them with pesticides. We're not only causing environmental damage, but it's also food waste. And so here's a way that we can use these things in a way that's more environmentally responsible. And, you know, fermentation, like making mustards, you know, you can, you can play with the greens, you can, um, you can take the seeds and make mustard. Um, you, can, you know, there's all, all kinds of stuff you can do. And I'm sure, Linda, I'm sure up there you have tons of different things you do too. Oh, absolutely. And the vinegars are definitely a big part of what I do. And, you know, I make garlic mustard vinegar mm -hmm. with the whole plants, you know, and I, yeah. I, I agree with you instead of, um, you know, spraying chemicals or hating plants, just, you know, eat them, you know, eat your weeds yeah. and bring them into your everyday diet. And I love, you know, we were talking about South River miso earlier. I mean, one of their signature misos has dandelion, nettle, seaweed, and wild leeks in it. <laughs> so, and I've done that with my misos. I've added mm -hmm. these things to, to my own miso that I make. And it's, it's really, it's fun. And then it adds deep extra nutrition, which is, mm -hmm. you know, a big part of my passion for sure is um, increasing the nutrient density of my food as much as possible. And yeah. adding the wild foods is just such a big part of that. Yeah. And I do, when you, when we talk about invasives, one of our invasives here is uh, mimosa, which I know there's a bunch of different things called mimosa. In this case, I'm talking about Albizia julibrisin, um, the, you know, the happiness tree, or there's a lot of different names for it, but with the little fluffy, cute flowers. Um, and I absolutely love these trees. I think they're gorgeous. Um, I also recognize that these trees are invasive. And so I don't worry about harvesting too many of the flowers because, <laughs> because they're everywhere, but the flowers are really, really good medicine. And so I actually have, I'll harvest a bunch of them. I'll, I'll make meads and sodas and tinctures and all these things. And about once a year, I have friends over and I just have this kind of gathering where we like cook food and we just have all of these mimosa beverages and like everybody's just in a great mood when we leave because we've had all this mimosa it's really nice yes absolutely <laughs> and you know um I wonder maybe you know we're talking about making ferments and um you know the a relationship with them and I think one of the relationships and and well, let me just back up a second. Having a relationship is really important with this food. I always joke that it's different. My grand, my 50s grandmother, you know, she was in the 1950s, loved TV dinners because they were so easy. And she didn't have to have a relationship with, the, with that food. And whereas when you're fermenting things, you need to have a relationship and you need to watch what's happening and, and pulse it, and which I love. That's something I really enjoy. And so I was wondering if you could talk some about the relationship as far as storing the food and, and when to move it to one place to the other, and maybe even a little bit of the history of that, because I think there's a lot, um, a lot of people I know have questions about that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of give, give a few things, then we can dive in in other directions as we want. Um, you know, when I think about relationship and storing food, I mean, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, seasonality, which we are not as tied to as we have historically been. Um, and, you know, so there's different things that we put up in different seasons. And so, you know, things like chickweed vinegar, provided you have chickweed growing, can be put up whenever, and that's fine. Uh, but there's other things. So when we talked about miso, if we want to make a longer aged miso, those work better in cooler weather. You want all of these things to be in room temperature. You want them to be comfortable. Um, I always give people kind of the guidance of if you are comfortable in a space, your ferments are probably comfortable. If you're super hot or super cold, they're probably not comfortable either. <laughs> but but as long as you're you know moderately comfortable, they're probably fine. Um, and, you know, so this is, you know, we have root cellars for this reason. Um, and so I, I, when I, when I think about seasonality and moving things, things that I don't want to have get really hot, I will put, I mean, of course, in my fridge, you put things in your fridge when they're done fermenting. Um, 
and that keeps them a certain temperature. If you have a root cellar, they can go in there. Um, yeah, but I think, you know, thinking about that seasonality and thinking when we think about relationship, it's not just our relationship with the seasons, it's our relationship with the food itself. It's our relationship with taking these ingredients we care about and turning them into something new and something that we're, that is a collaboration. You know, we are working with these microbes. We can set up the environment for them to do what we want them to do. And sometimes like they just won't feel like it. Like they just won't want to. Um, <laughs> most of the time they do. So if you have never fermented before, don't make, don't feel like that's discouraging, but you know, once, once in a great while, your ferment will just not feel like doing the thing. Um, and you know, it, it's an opportunity to learn about, okay, maybe I let this sit out too long. Oh, it turns out I set this in direct sunlight and didn't realize it. Or, oh, what, you know, whatever. And so then you learn, like, there's no, there's no failure. We don't have to feel bad, but it allows us, because of that relationship, allows us to learn, allows us to store our food in a way that is um, more responsible and delicious. Right. It's been so interesting to me because since I've been on my fermentation journey, I've moved to dramatically different regions mm. and that's been interesting to me to see what does well like when I first moved here right from the Pacific Northwest the, the first uh, year I had my sourdough starter out on my uh, kitchen table and I came out in the morning on the hottest day of the year and it was all over the kitchen table <laughs> <laughs> and that never yeah. happened in the Pacific Northwest. So you really, when you change regions and then you, your relationship shifts and things even tasted different when I changed mm -hmm. regions as well. Yeah. So I, I lived in Iowa for about 10 years and that's when I started fermenting. And then, yeah, I moved to Florida. So very different. And then up here to Atlanta. Um, and yeah, I mean, when I moved to Florida, I moved there in July in a car that had no AC. Um, it was a, what, an 18 hour drive, I think. Um, and so the ferment that like my sourdough starter that came with me on that journey. Um, yeah, I mean, like all of us were pretty hot and tired by the time we got to the house. Um, and yeah, but it was, it was, you know, I, things fermented a lot faster. Things tasted differently. Um you know, and part of that had to do with that just wherever you are, the microbial kind of fingerprint of each place you are will be slightly different. But also, like we were talking about before, the the heat and the, you know, the different temperature considerations um, and environmental considerations that go into that. You know, something in Florida and also here that I didn't have to deal with to the same extent in Iowa was the bugs, like just so many bugs all the time um you know i mean i i cover things and so fruit flies don't get in them and multiply but just there's i feel like if i'm ever at all remiss in that for a second it becomes a problem so much more quickly <laughs> here than it ever was up there <laughs> well i find it really interesting i have i know a person who teaches um fermentation in this region and he encourages people to um uh, capitalize if they want to make vinegar on fruit flies and <laughs> encourages them <laughs> so it's, it's this interesting thing because they carry you know the microbes yeah. that actually transform things into vinegar which is why winemakers you know really are are very unhappy when fruit flies show up <laughs> their, their wine cellar yeah no if they if if they didn't multiply and make my kitchen so unlivable I would be happy to <laughs> welcome them but yeah we have we have year round like we have mosquitoes probably 11 months of the year here so it's a different different world than I'm used to yeah. <laughs> Yes, I mean, just changing those regions. And then if you think about it, you have to, what, one of the things I've noticed too is when I've moved to a couple different, even in the same region, still my space needs to become inoculated or get that mm -hmm. imprint. Um, and when I've lived somewhere for a while, I'll cultivate that and then I'll move and then I have to cultivate that again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being someone who's really interested in the, you know, um, microbes for health, 
and you know the beneficial bacteria i think about that with our guts too like if we're moving or transforming or shifting mm -hmm. that it may take time also for our um, gut microbes to catch up with us and and you know populate <laughs> correctly yeah absolutely you know when we think about even just traveling places you know when i'm traveling i eat i mean a ton of ferments um most of the time but when i'm traveling depending where I'm going, maybe not as much. Um, yeah, and so I I don't normally take probiotic pills for a number of reasons. Um, one being that I think single strain probiotics aren't as robustly healthy for our guts as a variety of microbes. Um, but there are, I mean, there are some that are multi-strain probiotics. And so if I'm like, if I'm going to be traveling somewhere and I know that I'm going to like not have access to my normal store of ferments, I'll actually bring some of those with me for that reason. So that my gut microbiome can continue to kind of get, you know, get the probiotic and then I bring fiber too for prebiotics. Sure. Absolutely. And for digestion, when we put things in our ferments, we can capitalize on putting those prebiotics and the, and, you know, like I put a lot, try to put a lot of inulin or algin mm -hmm. or those things in my ferments to, um, optimize them and they can just be this powerhouse of nutritional density when you Absolutely. add a lot of different things like I like to add burdock to my mm -hmm. sauerkraut <laughs> <laughs> things like that to really increase because that's really high in inulin and minerals mm -hmm. and so yeah it's it's such a, a intriguing <laughs> process yeah well, and when we think about a lot of traditional fermented foods, a lot of them are both prebiotic and probiotic. Sauerkraut, like you just said, you know, kimchi, like a lot of them have have both. And it's I, I always find it interesting when we think about that, because it's like our ancestors knew what they were doing, even if they didn't fully understand the science behind it. Like they had a sense of that this was the thing they needed to be doing. Well, and it's, um, you know, for health, but it's also was a preservation technique, kind of what you talked about before about the seasonality. And if mm -hmm. I want to have cabbage in, you know, February in this region, it's a really good idea to make sauerkraut. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> so you have it and you know that it, that's one of the um the benefits of fermentation is its preservation um qualities and one way to preserve food and i know you talked about refrigerating your ferments one of the reasons i ferment is because i don't always have room in my refrigerator so creating a space like a root cellar space um, to be able to store them because you don't have to have a refrigerator. You can store them mm -hmm. in a cool place. If you um, create that space, you can, you know, store lots of ferments. Um, I, I do that during the winter months. So, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, no. And there was, um, I remember uh, Sander was talking about um, when I was at my residency with him, that there was somebody who had, one of his former residency students who is from Puerto Rico and one of the hurricanes that had knocked out all of the power there, she was the only one of her neighbors who really had any food because she fermented. And so she still had viable food after several days, whereas everybody else, you know, had like milk and eggs and stuff in their fridge. And, you know, once you refrigerate eggs, you can't put them back out on the counter. So they, um, they just didn't have food anymore and she was like well i'm fine i made all this sauerkraut <laughs> so she was very popular with her neighbors apparently <laughs> right well and that's a kind of a broader topic we were we probably could do a whole um session on this but i'll just mention it briefly is learning to store food without refrigeration is a really mm -hmm. good skill and yeah. i've lived on land where we didn't have refrigeration so knowing that if you don't put eggs in the fridge you don't have to and mm -hmm. you can leave them out and you know i was taught to ro just rotate them like the mother hen does <laughs> so just that relationship with the food and really um you know knowing how things will store and so that you can have them later is yeah is is a whole whole skill and whole world in of itself <laughs> and i love so when i you know was looking at your um background and thinking about um 
how it, you're you it looks like you've been really interested in like that food waste stream and and mm -hmm. being able to reuse and and access and I wondered if you have any recipes in your book that you want to highlight or underscore in that in that realm. Yeah, so I actually so I actually have sitting next to me off off screen I have some show and tell stuff that is actually food waste related so I will pull that up because I think that will be a useful thing here. So I'm sure many yes. people here are familiar with fire cider. Um but here's one I'm working on right now. And Beautiful. so for people who don't know what fire cider is, it is an apple unpasteurized apple cider vinegar. Um it's typically what we use. But um you just want to pack as much goodness as you can in here. Um hot peppers, garlic, this one has citrus and herbs and peppercorns and onions and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it, you know, I mean, there's as many recipes for fire cider as, you know, as there are people who make it. Um, but it's a very, very wonderful health tonic that I absolutely love. And it actually also has a really interesting history we can get into at some point if we feel so called. Um, but as we all know, when you make an infused vinegar, you strain all that stuff out. And so, you know, if we think about this jar, all of this is getting strained out well what are we going to do with all of that mm -hmm. um and there's a few things you know you can you can blend it up and use it as a marinade for say you know meats or vegetables or something um what i tend to do is i dehydrate it and so i have a little kind of sample jar here of this is from my last batch and this is just all that same stuff citrus and hot peppers and everything that i've dried out um and i just put it in i have a a dehydrator you can also use your oven on the lowest setting or a solar dehydrator or whatever um and then i grind it i use a coffee grinder that is not the same one i use for my coffee um and i just make seasoning blends out of it and this is what my family gets for gifts every year is whatever i i made into um infused vinegars they get eventually powdered in jars and that's that's their holiday gifts um and they seem to like it which is great <laughs> that's, wonder that's a wonderful idea <laughs> <laughs> yeah cheap too which is also i'm really into <laughs> absolutely and i think people know what to do with some powdered spice something because a mm -hmm. lot of times if you gave them a ferment like say you gave them that jar <laughs> right they'd be <laughs> like, <laughs> like what <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah like but you know well the nice thing too when we go back to infused vinegars one of my favorite ones to make is if i make something i tend to make things with strawberries and jalapenos around the same time if not the same dish and so i'll make strawberry top and jalapeno top vinegars and i'll mix them together and it's absolutely delicious but then i can take those tops and i can make another seasoning blend too and that's nice. I mean, I like that on cocktails. I like that. Um, I mean, again, just to kind of on, you know, salads or on whatever. I mean, yeah, like you said, people tend to be more creative when you give them a seasoning blend as opposed to when I, when I give people a vinegar, when I'm just like, here's, you know, I, I infused this vinegar for you and I did all of this and they're just like, <laughs> they don't know what to do <laughs> unless they're know, people, people yeah. ask me all the time what do we do with vinegar i'm like oh my gosh there's a million things everything <laughs> but people don't yeah don't put that together so i love that i know one of my favorite ingredients for i i'm not a big a pepper fan so i usually use horseradish for the heat mm -hmm. And so then it really, if you blend it up, it makes like a horseradish sauce. And so mm -hmm. you can utilize that, to, you know, just like you would any other horseradish and you have some of the other ingredients in there. So yeah, it's yeah. a good way to, to work with that. And it's of course a remedy if you have a cold or a flu, it really um, can um, uh, stop it in its tracks really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I have a spoonful of it every day this time of year, just seasons changing getting trying to make sure everything stays healthy yeah i actually the last time i made some which was recently i just opened it up to see how it was doing and just smelling it opened up myself <laughs> <laughs> i didn't even have to ingest it <laughs> yeah so do you have any other um show and tells for us yeah let's see what else i've got down here 
Yeah, so kind of going back to foraging, I was going to loosen the cap on this. I'm not going to because it's kind of full. Um, so this is, and you can't really see it probably super well, but these are pieces of mimosa bark from a mimosa branch that I cut down off that tree I mentioned along with some rose hips. And this is just a mead that I'm making. So again, when we think about both foraging and food waste, those rose hips were from a bush that was dying, um, but that had put out hips. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, don't want those to go to waste. And then this branch I cut down as part of kind of my pruning practice. And so, you know, out of that, I was able to make this medicinal herbal mead um, and not waste those. So that's one let's see did you use the sweetener in that was it hot, plain honey just Wild plain honey. honey i can't remember which honey i used in that particular one i think just a wildflower honey of some sort okay great. um but yeah i normally have i mean like a dozen kinds of honey at the house at any one time <laughs> i know it's amazing how many different types of and flavors of yeah honey yeah well, and we're really blessed because we can get Tupelo honey down here, which is one of my favorites. Um, and so, yeah, I, I make a lot of Tupelo honey things. Nice. Yeah, so this one, so when we were talking about different places tasting different ways, I call this one my adventure ferment. This has been with me. So I started this um, in, was it late 2018, early 2019? It was right after my grandma passed and I was like packing up her house and like all of this stuff. And I put the like the last of the vegetables that she had in her house into a brine as I was driving and then drove back up to my house. And then ever since then, I've brought this brine with me everywhere I've traveled, even overseas. And so it's been with me. I mean, I bring like a little vial of it. I don't like bring this whole jar. But, um but I'll bring like a little vial and I'll like find an edible plant wherever I'm traveling and I'll like put, you know, a little piece of something in there and kind of do that every day. But it's been with me to several continents um, and all, all around the U.S. And yeah, it now it's really interesting because when I open it and smell it, it like reminds me of the smell of all the places that I've been since 2019. So it's kind of cool. Um, yeah. So this one, it just has carrots in it um, right now. But it's at this point, it's such, you know, perpetual brine um, pickles for anybody who makes like pausai or anything like that, um, which are just ferments. So perpetual brine ferments are just ferments where you keep adding vegetables to the brine um, rather than making a new brine every time. Um, one of the benefits to that is that it um, it will pickle them more quickly. I mean, at this point, this one, I can throw carrots in there and it's like, I mean, like they just ferment so fast. It's very energetic <laughs> ferment. Well, that's um, the epitome of relationship. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and then so this one's kind of fun. So this one is, I made a malt vinegar out of purple barley, and it's like pink, it turns. So the beer itself, when I made it, was still kind of purpley. And then once it turned into vinegar, it's like this kind of like a rosé color which is kind of fun nice and then the last thing I have down here is this so this is the first time I've made this one this is something that Sander posted about a few weeks ago where he learned to make a um a sourdough discard cauliflower pickle um from somebody else and so basically yeah you use you make the brine and add in sourdough starter as an inoculant and um i put in some garlic in there because i wanted garlic in there um yeah it i mean it smells good i'm excited to try it <laughs> beautiful so it was just can we just go through the process of that i, th I think yeah um it would be helpful because i know it's simple but it, it, if you could just go through the steps of what you added that i think that would be helpful yeah so for this one i think so i just dumped um sourdough starter in there i'll be honest i didn't measure it it's probably like about a quarter cup <laughs> yeah. something like that um and then you know obviously the whole uh cauliflower florets um this is probably a two percent brine and so what that means is two percent of salt in the water um so you made the salt brine 
yeah separately. yeah so i mix the salt brine and this um and the sourdough together um okay. And I can't I can't remember if his original recipe used salt or not. I used salt in this one. Um just to see. Um yeah, and what's interesting about it is now that I've shaken it up, it's all cloudy again, but it was really clear and um Yeah, when you first held uh, it up, it was very clear. I wasn't I was like, what are those potatoes? <laughs> <laughs> that was my first thought. Yeah, yeah. So I'm excited to try that one, but it's you know it's I I wanted to share it because it's such a good example of you know, no matter how long we've been fermenting stuff, we always learn new techniques and new things. Like there's, you will never stop learning about fermentation. <laughs> well, and that's a great example of you know again utilizing your sourdough for something and mm -hmm. utilizing so the inoculants can be transferable so you can go oh mm -hmm. i'm gonna do this i'll try this inoculant and it's just it's just yeah it's the never-ending projects and experiments and possibilities <laughs> yeah there's something i've been experimenting with um that's still very early stages like i don't have a written recipe for it yet or anything but um so i make I've been making, you know, nut milks, like not, I don't make almond milk as much because I try not to use almonds, but like pecan milk and stuff, like a decent amount. But I, for some reason right now, I just have an insane amount of dried beans. I have so, I I have so many dried beans, um, more than I would ever be able to eat. And so I was like, what am I going to do with all these beans? Um, and so I started experimenting with making bean milks. Um, I was like, well, soy milk, bean milk, right? So like other bean milks. And so I, I've made like, I made black eyed pea milk this morning. Um, it's actually really good. Um, I made a dookie bean milk. Um, and so I've just been kind of experimenting with that and then experimenting with, because obviously you don't want to eat um raw beans but i feel bad throwing all those solids away so i've been trying to figure out how to work with them and something that i'm experimenting with is sourdough discard and then like sauerkraut brine as ways as inoculants to ferment those little bean bits and make like a vegan like parmesan situation um and that's been kind of fun to play with so we'll see where that goes <laughs> yeah, that sounds really fun. I know um, when we were talking about miso, one of the things that's intrigued me is that, um, you know, there's lots of different beans you can utilize when you're, you know, to ferment. And one I hadn't seen a whole lot of were um, black beans. So I started playing with making a black bean miso and it definitely has a unique flavor, but mm -hmm. I, I like it. And so, I mean, really, I think the encouraging, hopefully everybody's catching the ball on this, that really experiment, have fun and read books like Julia's book and Sandra Kout's book, and then get that foundation and then just go and play and experiment mm -hmm. because there's so much room for it. And I know, um, I think we're um, at a point where we probably want to start taking some questions questions i know i think there might be some in the chat and then um, we could open it up maria are there questions that you want to um uh throw our way or yeah if um, anybody wants to ask the, ask their own question directly yeah, that, um amy just asked um if you had any experience with tempeh and can you talk about that yeah so i um I've made tempeh for a few years. I actually just um, finished writing a tempeh recipe for a friend's book, um, which is very exciting. Um, so I find tempeh to be very easy, um, easy to make. Um, it, you know, it's also a great place to experiment. You know, Linda talked about you can use black beans instead of, um, you know, soybeans for me. So we'll, you know, same thing with tempeh. My favorite tempeh I've ever made is with black eyed peas. I a, a trend you'll notice with anything I make with beans is that I do a lot of black eyed peas. My family are southern. I, I live in the south. Like it's we, I am of this place. Um, and that is reflected in my bean usage. Uh, and so, but I mean, black eyed pea tempeh is like one of the best things I've ever tasted. Um, so all of that is to say, um, that I highly recommend making it. You can get the starter from Cultures for Health and a number of other places. And those come with the directions 
Um, I've used cultures for cultures for health many times. Um, it's pretty easy to use, and yeah, I like them. And that's the one that I also um, found easier than I thought it was going to be. I, I thought it was going to be really complicated. Yeah. Um, got my feet wet at the residency with Sander Katz and then started making it. And I d never liked um, store like commercial mm -hmm. tempeh at yeah, all. Yeah. But I fell in love with the um home the homemade tempeh. So I really encourage people. It's not as hard as you would think. So yeah. And the flavor, I mean just so much better so much right better. and i know one of my classes we were making tempeh and then we made tempeh rubens for a uh, lunch and it was just really is there there it's quite versatile as a mm -hmm. food for sure yeah so any other questions or anybody have their hand up maria that yeah trisha wanted to ask a question yeah actually i had um three quick questions about safety so the first, um, so I've been doing fermenting for a couple of years now. I started with kombucha, then I did some kefir and vegetables. I tried kimchi a couple times and I always have a problem with the kimchi with a little bit of mold. Like it'll be one little spot of mold getting on the side. And everybody says, if you have one spot of mold, you have to toss the whole entire thing. And I'm thinking, my grandma was Polish. She made sauerkraut. I can't imagine her throwing away a whole vat of sauerkraut for her family of six because of one little thing of mold. So, in your opinion, do I is it okay to skim part of it, or do you really have to throw away the entire thing? So, um, I always encourage people to trust their own best judgment with that. For me personally. I'll tell you what I would do for myself, and I encourage you to do what you think is best. What I would do for myself is I would base it on, um, one, the color of the mold. Um, you know, if we have something like a red color or bright colors, then no. Um, if it's a little bit of white fuzzy mold, that's, I mean, I, I find that to be fine. Mm -hmm. um, and I would scoop that off and I would maybe scoop off a layer of the kimchi. But then most importantly, what I would do is I would make sure everything was weighted. And so one of the ways that I do that is I will take actually, I leave whole cabbage leaves out um, during the processing and I will put those, I'll fold them and put them on top mm -hmm. so that they hold all those little bits of cabbage. Yeah, I always yeah. seem to have one little piece that manages yeah. to come out. <laughs> finds its way up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then my second question is you had mentioned reusing the brine and I was always told that you have to dump the brine after each and every time. I right now I have some pickled red onions in my fridge that are getting low. I'm like, man, I got to throw this brine away and start all over. So I I can reuse it? Is that You okay? can reuse it. I one thing I would encourage you to do is to check the salinity of it because the salinity will change um as you pickle things in it. Um it'll get more diluted. Um, with lacto ferment brines, you want it to taste salty like the sea, you know, roughly like you want it to have that about that level of salinity. Sure. So if you need to add some more salt, add some more salt, but yeah, it should be fine. Oh, cool. Okay. And then my last question is for Linda. Um, so Linda, I actually took your class, um, three years ago, almost at the Wellspring. Um, it was a gift for the holidays class. It was super fun. We made a whole bunch of different things felted soap and all kinds of things. Um, and one of the things we made was a garlic honey. So we mm -hmm. had crushed up some garlic and put it in honey and somehow got pushed to the back of my fridge. And then we moved um, recently and I found it. I'm like, oh, here's that honey, garlic honey I made three years ago. Can I, is it still good? <laughs> well, I, I think what Julia said is really important is, you know, smelling it, tasting yeah, it. Yeah, it smells interesting. Good, actually. But generally speaking, honey does not go bad and garlic doesn't either. So I would, okay. especially if you have it in your fridge, I would find it hard to believe that it would yeah, be. Yeah, no, it looks and smells good, but I'm like, I want to make sure there's no botulism or anything lurking in there. Well, see, the thing is garlic carries botulism spores. It, mm -hmm. And if it were growing botulism, you would know like the lid would buckle or something. Oh, okay. So, and the spores, adults, of course, we can, you know, pass the spores and we have no problems. 
kids. But if it if there was botulism actually growing in it, you would know, and it would have it would have a lot of it would be more liquidy and water like okay. if that were happening. Are and you doing that class so, again? That was so fun. Yes, I am. Yes, yeah. Yes. Just email me, and we, I can let you know about it. So, yeah, and yeah. and I'm actually going to be doing a fermentation immersion at the Midwest Women's Herbal Conference as a pre-conference. Okay. Um, hands on. Yeah. So yeah, we'll fermentation be camp. Yes. Yes. Fermentation camp. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Good to see you. That's it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else? There are a bunch of questions that just came into the chat. If you have any capacity to consolidate them, if they're at all similar, that would be. Yeah. Let's see. Um. So how about um, for someone whose gut isn't very, quote unquote, strong and would be considered damp and cold in traditional Chinese medicine um, and for whom moderate amounts of inulin causes uh, moderate discomfort, more than moderate discomfort, other than starting with small amounts of ferments and working up, is there a particular kind of ferment you recommend starting with? Well, one thing is when you think about being cool or cold, um, lean toward warming things, of course. So like the fire cider and small amounts um, make sense building up. Um, usually it seems that people need to inoculate your gut just like you inoculate your ferments. And sometimes eating too many ferments all at once, if you haven't eaten many ferments, can really can you know be distressing but usually if you build up and you eat a lot of diversity of ferments as well um that can be really helpful and you know small amounts of miso soup you know which you know you can you don't want to boil the miso in the soup but having it be warm those are things that i think of um and i don't know julia if you think can think of anything to add to that yeah i mean i think fire <clears throat> cider is a good recommendation fermented hot sauces i mean even even if it's something that you end up cooking into something like let's say using a yogurt in a cooked sauce or something um just just having the the ferment in there you know we're learning more about postbiotics which is something i don't personally know a ton about but we're starting to see research on that even just having a probiotic food that's been cooked is healthier for you than having the non probiotic version so that's well, something I really more, want. Way more digestible. There's no mm -hmm, doubt about definitely. that because that's one of the things ferments do is make the food more digestible. Even after you bake a loaf of bread, the bread yeah. is more digestible. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, what about, uh, what is the average lifespan of fermented foods? So um there is no average across all fermented foods, I would say. Um, I mean, it really, you know, if we think about fermented foods, these are foods that were made to preserve things. And so we tend to have a pretty long lifespan on them. Um, in some cases, they may shift into something else. So if we think about beer, um, if you leave beer out and expose it to air, it's going to eventually become vinegar. Um, same with wine. Um, you know, sauerkraut will get more sour and like, you know, it's never going to turn into something that's not sauerkraut, but it will become more sauerkrauty. Um, it may get mushy. Um, you know, I would say, I would say it really depends. I mean, I, one of my friends just cracked open a thing of miso that she started making in 2017 and she just started eating it yesterday. So, you know, all of that is to say it, it I, I, there's not really an average. I mean, you can, if you feel like it tastes good and this is where your sense is guiding you is so important. If it tastes good to you, that's a good time to put it in the fridge because that slows down the fermentation and then just eat it. And as long as it's, um, yeah, still tastes good and still looks good. That's all that matters. Cool. Um, Danielle and Duane. You have a couple questions in here, and I'm wondering if you would want to um, unmute yourself and just come on and ask hey, instead of me yeah. reading all of it. <laughs> uh, I, I find this fascinating. I'm so sorry I'm about the entire show late, so you may have already addressed this at the, at the very beginning. I got my time wrong. 
um, but I'll certainly be tuning in to future um, things like this. So thank you for having this. My question- We will be sending you a recording, so. Awesome, oh, that's amazing. Thank you, gosh, <laughs> we're all lucky. Um, I'm trying to wrap my head around the basics of fermentation, and I certainly don't want to take everyone's time if you've already addressed this, and there's a power of Google that I'm already on and looking up um, these basic questions. But as far as I can understand, you can ferment with bacteria or yeast. Is that correct? One mm -hmm. or the other? Or and, both. Mm -hmm. Or both. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> and is there a difference health-wise in using one over the other? Say you're making a beverage or, and why does yeast, I feel like this is elementary school fermentation, I know, but why does yeast produce alcohol and bacteria no alcohol? So I think these are great things, um, you know, like you said, to dive in um, directly with a uh, with some books and other resources to get some more specifics, but a good broad overview. Um, so you can ferment with bacteria, yeast, uh, mold, like the koji we were talking about um, earlier. Um, and so basically it's less about the health benefits of each and more that each has a different function. So yeast will produce alcohol bacteria um, like lactic acid uh, bacteria will acidify a brine um, they just they serve different functions sometimes those functions overlap if we think about beet kvass for example that is a carbonated beverage that is like yeasty and bacteria -y. Um, typically because our environment has all these microbes in it you're not going to get just one or the other um, but yeah, I mean, they have different functions. Um, you can get, if you need to get inoculants, you can buy those online. Cultures for Health is one that I usually recommend um, just because they have very easy to follow instruction uh, for beginners, but there's a ton of different places out there. And then of course, there's a lot of different uh, good books too. For, for beginner materials, I really like uh, Kirsten and Christopher Shockey's uh, fermented vegetables book is a good place to start, um, just kind of as a very base level uh, vegetable making book. Thank you so much. And then um, if they all have different functions, would one be better for the gut than the other, say a kvass over a kombucha? So again, this is going to depend more on your body than anything. Um, I mean, the thing that's best for your gut is to have a diversity of microbes and a diversity of ferments. And really microbes of place, because mm -hmm. making your own ferments is going to give you a lot stronger, more robust digestive system than purchasing and getting mm -hmm. um, microbes that are in something that was created in a, you know, a more sterile kitchen. Having your, your the diversity from your environment, because you're part of your environment, is a big piece of it. And one other thing I like to tell people is, um, you know, we sometimes uh, in the in the natural health world, people think yeast is the enemy or or that fungi is the enemy. But there's this whole new like awareness about like the microbiome and uh, you know how uh, fungi is important to digest to the metabolization of uh, microbes and how they interact. And so are yeasts. But in moderation, some of the yeasts um, are can become problematic like candida is very opportunistic. Everybody has candida, but it's when your micro microbiome is out of whack that it becomes opportunistic. So just, I think it's important when it comes to gut health, the diversity, like you're saying, um, Julia, is so important and a diversity of place as much as possible. And then realizing that some of these things, bacteria should be the most predominant, but these other factors are important as well mm -hmm. to gut, gut health. So, yes. Oh, interesting. Thank you. One last question. And then there are a hundred other people I know. Um, do you suggest steering clear of canned fermented products, meaning um, canned in aluminum as cans are lined with plastic? Is there any risk of an acidic product like that breaking down that lining and getting into the product? I mean, I'm less worried about the lining than the fact that a canned ferment is no longer probiotic. Um, and so if you're going to be eating probiotic foods, you might as well get living probiotic foods. 
how were they able to be labeled as probiotic, like the kombuchas on the shelf? That's, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> That's outside okay. of my expertise. Okay. Well, no, and you know, sometimes, I don't know about you, Julia, but I say to people, I know a lot more about ferments that I make in my kitchen than I do about products on the shelf. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, um, I'm definitely not a commercial ferment uh, expert. Yeah. Can you just, yeah. one last thing, explain why they're not once they enter a can because well so canning um if you heat process them it kills the microbes okay basic thank you you guys are amazing <laughs> thank you so i think we're coming toward the end of our time thank maria you. do you want to um yeah. take it from here i i want to um but I will say, Julia, thank you so much. This was such a rich, enjoyable yeah. conversation. And we, as the Midwest Women's Herbal, we just love partnering with amazing, strong, um, smart, wise women who are nourishing the world. So um, we have a question we like to ask people um, at the end of our, our meeting. And the question is, is kind of rhetorical, but if you have a short response to it, what if nourishment works? What if it works? How would, you, how would you respond to that question? I mean, if nourishment works, since, you know, since I think of everything in, in terms of community as like our seen and our unseen community, you know, nourishment to me would mean that we would be nourishing both communities. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for Thank writing you. the book. Thank you for spending this time with us. And I'm going to hand it over to Maria. Thank you, ladies. That was an amazing conversation. I know I'm not alone when I say I've learned a lot tonight. So cool. Love learning about ferments. And um, and I really want to make miso now. I like really want to make miso. <laughs> we love it. And thank you for everyone attending tonight. We appreciate your time and attention and your participation. Um, so let's give away some goodies, shall we? Who's ready to win something? All right. So we are going to give away Julia's book first. And how this is going to work is Jill is going to use a random number generator. And we're going to pull a number at random. And I will announce the name uh, connected to that number on our spreadsheet. And if you're here, I want you to raise your hand. And, um, and then we'll be contacting you. We will email you for your address to give to Story Publishing so they can send out your book. Okay. And thank you Does to them for doing it. Cool Jill, you want to go ahead and give me a number and I'll see if I can find that spreadsheet. You bet. All right. The first number I got is 56. Yes. Thank you to Story Publishing. Definitely. Jill, are you picking a number? Yeah. Um, 56 is the first one I got. 56. That is, sorry, I have to take my glasses off to see this. Kelly Gray Meisner. Kelly, are you here? Going once, going twice. Okay, go ahead and pick another. All right, the second number I got is 335. 335. You can see I need new glasses. Pardon me while I smashed my face into the camera to see this number. Did you say, what was it again? 335. 335. 335. Sally Powell. Are you here, Sally? You can go ahead and unmute yourself or jump in the chat. Sally Powell, going once, going twice. All right. Let's try Let's it again. Third, third's a charm. Three times a charm. All, All right. right. The next number I got is 504. 504. Callie Bohm. Are you here, Callie? No, no, Callie. Okay. All right. 554. 554. Laura Flint. Laura Flint, are you here? How about 
How about we try something else? Yes. How about I'm going to, I'm going to flick my mouse over the list and wherever it stops, that's who's going to win. That's a good idea. <laughs> All right. Laura Schmidt. Hello, I'm here. Laura Yay. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> All it's right. hard. There, yeah. there, there are 90 women here, but over 700 signed up. So that could have taken a long time. So, yes. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Congratulations. You're going to love it. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. I'm just writing your name down so I don't forget. All right. Congratulations, Laura. All right. So what is next? We are going to. We're going to give away the implementation learning module. All right. So Linda, do you want to talk a little bit about the classroom? Sure. Um, we're what we're gonna gonna be giving away as part of our brand new classroom space, and we're gonna have audio and video learning modules um, from women teaching from all over the world. Um, one of the teachers in that module is Jessica Prentice, who wrote a beautiful book called Full Moon, Full Moon Feast, some workshops from me, and then you um, go through the modules and then you get a question and answer time with um, myself and or guest instructors. And this is a classroom that we're opening that's going to have a lot of different modules. And this particular one that we're going to offer to you is called uh, Fantastic Fermentation. And then there'll be other ones on wild edibles, on uh, all different um, types of topics. So keep your eyes out. We'll be sending you some information about that space um, going forward. All right. So let's go ahead and give away that class. So I'm going to do the one thing again. I'm going to scroll right there. How about uh, Caroline? Oh, I'm here. All right. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Caroline, what's your last name? Morris. Sorry, M O R R I S. Congratulations. Right. Uh, Congratulations, Caroline. We'll be contacting you to give you registration information and code. Okay, thank you. Nice. All right. That was fun. Congratulations, everyone. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for attending tonight's class. And especially Julia and Linda for such an amazing and insightful conversation. Uh, it's so much fun. And we look forward to seeing all of you in the future at Midwest Women's Herbal Events. Whether it's in our own hands or in the classroom or um, this spring at the Herbal Conference, which we will be launching um, registration for mid-December. So keep an eye out for that. And just one more last quick announcement, um, our In Our Own Hands series right now is in early bird registration phase, and that will um, end on December 1st. So if you use your coupon code that you got in your email box and you register before December 1st, you get the deepest discount. And so it makes it just so much easier to, to join and have a great time with us. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And have a wonderful night. Do you have any last words, Linda? Just want to thank everybody um, for being here and also the team for holding this space. Um, this is a space that gets um, held and curated and produced, and it gives us a chance to really have that deep conversation. So thank you to the team for doing that. And just one last big thank you to Julia. Really um, mm -hmm. enjoyed being with you tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it was really amazing. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. All right. Good Thank night, you. everyone.